I was born Elois Marie Miller on September 14, 1924, in Shawnee, Oklahoma. I was two and a half years old when my parents packed me and my baby sister up in a Model A Ford, and we traveled all the way from Oklahoma to California over a wooden plank road. It took us seven days to get there. I was a kid during the Depression, and we moved around a lot. My dad had to go where the work was. But we mostly lived in Northern California in the gold fields where he worked in the big gold mines. I graduated from high school in 1942 and after high school I did lots of jobs. I was a waitress, I worked in the fruit packing sheds, just did whatever I could to make a buck. I was about 20 when I took a job in Berkeley at the Bell Telephone Company. Back in those days, the operator had to manually connect all the telephone calls, and that's what I did. I worked at a big, giant switchboard, and people would call me with a number, and I would have to take my little plug, and I'd plug them into that number. I will never forget the day that Port Chicago blew up. I wasn't too far away from that, and I could hear the explosion. This is where they kept the munitions ships for the Navy. The minute that explosion happened, my switchboard lit up like a Christmas tree and blew out all the fuses. Being a telephone operator, it was a good job, but I was looking for a little excitement in my life and I was kind of itching to leave home and the military just kind of seemed a, like a good option for me. Thousands of WACs, trained and disciplined the Army way, are now on duty all over this country and overseas. But thousands more are needed. Women from all walks of life, sales girls, industrial workers, librarians, housewives, entertainers, office workers, executives, designers, teachers, college women, women of all races, all creeds, American women. In our pioneer days, women held the powder horn for their fighting men. Today, they are joining the WAC. It was late fall of 1944 when I made that tearful goodbye to my family, and I boarded a train for Fort Des Moines, Iowa, where I was to do my basic training. This was the start of my big adventure, and at 20 years old, I was finally going to be able to get away from home for good. When I arrived, us newly enlisted were met by the WAC cadre and we were immediately loaded up in a big giant truck. I remember it was late fall and it was pretty darn cold coming from California and in Iowa it was really cold riding in the back of that truck. We were issued our summer and winter uniforms, our duffel bag, laundry bag, shoes, little Abner boots, they called them back then, our dress shoes, GI handbag, GI khaki underwear, which by the way, I didn't wear those. I snuck in my civilian undies and wore those instead. Also, they gave us PJs, a robe, and slippers. And we had to send all of our civilian clothes back home. Now, we didn't have to get that famous GI haircut, thank God for small favors, but we did have to keep our hair off of our collar, which was really hard for me because of my short neck. I remember my first GI party, but let me tell you, that was no party. I was handed a brush and told to get the scrubbing. I had a fever because I just got my shots, but that was no excuse. I had to keep on scrubbing. Welcome to the Army. Well, my basic training lasted about six weeks and consisted of classroom instruction. We put on gas masks and had to go through a gas chamber. And we did field military drilling. And since it was wintertime, we wore these big, long woolen overcoats. On graduation day, we had a big group picture taken. And wouldn't you know it, they put me in the very back, the shortest girl out of all of them. And I got put up at the very top. Can you see me back there? Thank you. 
Then we were given our permanent assignments. I initially wanted to be a Jeep driver, but, you know, being that five foot two girl, I didn't make the height requirement. Guess they couldn't see over the steering wheel. I don't know. But anyway, they sent me to Parachute Rigger School in Fort Benning, Georgia. I have to tell you that when I arrived there, I was really impressed by those cute paratroopers walking around post in their jump boots and baggy jumpsuits. So now I'm back in school and I'm learning how to pack a parachute. And that's called a rigger. And after six weeks of training, we had a big pinning ceremony when a high-ranking official, I don't know, could have been a general, a colonel, my mind is a little fuzzy, but we got wings put on our uniforms. It's the same wings that the paratroopers wore, only there was a big R in the middle, and that stood for, you guessed it, rigger. There were only 40 of us whack riggers in the U.S. Army, and I was one of them. I was one of the elite, and I was proud to wear those wings on my uniform. But as excited as I was to finally be a rigger, it just didn't happen right away. Again, my height was an issue. They just didn't think that I was tall enough to pack a parachute by myself. So they assigned me as a parachute repairman. So you know that old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I griped enough and they finally said, okay, Miller, let's see how you can pack a chute. And boy, did they find out that dynamite comes in small packages. I packed that damn thing just as fast and good as any of them. No problem. And I was immediately assigned to the packing shed and my sewing days were over. In the packing shed, we would pack chutes with two people to a table. And sometimes the chutes would come in from the field all tangled up like a big giant bowl of spaghetti. And that was a one person job to untangle that mess. There were 26 panels in a jump parachute and 32 in a cargo chute. We would attach the chute to the end of the table and then straighten out those lines. We sat one on each side on the edge of the table and would cross the lines over our shoulders to straighten the canopy so that we could fold it for packing in the tray. Then we laid it back on the table and used the folding irons to fold it. After folding the chute, then we would lay it on the pack tray. Over the pack tray, we would lace cord and fold the static line over the cover. After we packed the chute, then we'd have to date and put our initials in the little logbook that was always carried with the chute. <laughs> we always said that if it didn't open, just bring it back and we'll give you another one. But all kidding aside, we did have one paratrooper killed when I worked there. But the investigation found that it was a malfunctioning parachute and not the fault of the rigger. And then on the end of the chute attached to the table, we would tie a pilot chute to the apex of the main chute. And we were told that the pilot chute made a much easier opening of the main chute and eliminated some of that opening jerk. Boy, I remember having a very deep cut on my finger from lacing, but it soon became a really hard callus. We learned a special way to cut the heavy cord with our hands and didn't use a knife. There was a job that I didn't like very much, and that was having to go to the plane hangers and do what's called the rigger rolling. And that was rolling up the chutes for storage. And we didn't have a partner to help us, like in the packing sheds. And I wasn't strong enough to really roll them that tight. And then when I'd pick them up, all the guts would fall out of them and I'd have to roll them up again. Thank goodness we didn't have to do that job very often. A really exciting day was when us riggers got to go up into the C-47, the big plane that the paratroopers jumped out of, and see our actual parachutes in action. And since each chute is logged by the rigger, I knew exactly what trooper was wearing my chute. It was a real nervous time though when that jump master standing by the open door yelled, okay, stand up. And then he would yell, hook up. And before you can bat an eye, those troopers were at the door ready to go. And then they started jumping one right after the other in rapid succession. And if any one of them hesitated, that jump master just pushed him right out the door. Watching those paratroopers in action, I knew that that was risky business that they were involved in. Even though I knew I had a good packed parachute, anything can happen to them. Like one time there was a demonstration and the wind picked up and blew those paratroopers all over the place. Some were landing on top of cars in convertibles. It was a mess. They were just at the mercy of that wind. And then we got to go out in the field and watch a night jump. But there really wasn't much to see as it was pitch dark, but we could hear the thump, thump, thump of them landing all around us. That was a little eerie. During World War II, 
the Army used a lot of gliders for the paratroopers to jump out of and to bring supplies in because they were silent. They didn't have motors. They were towed up into the air by a motorized airplane and then they would let go. And we got to ride in one one time. And I just remember the sound of the wind and just soaring around and the, the view was just spectacular. So working at Fort Benning as a parachute rigger was just like another job, but I had to wear a uniform and I made friends and I got to leave post and go to the movies and things like that. But I remember the sergeant felt that it was necessary to march us back and forth to work and the packing sheds were literally just walking distance from our barracks. And I thought that was so silly, like we couldn't find our way home. So we just started falling out and going to the PX on the way home. And next thing you know, the sergeant looks back and he's lost half of his troops. And finally he just gave up and we didn't have to march anymore. I remember it being so hot in the summer in Georgia. And I hated wearing a hat because it was just so muggy and sticky and it was just not good for my hair. I had my hat on me, but I just never had it on my head. And I would hear, Miller, you're out of uniform, where's your hat? Seemed like that captain knew to when to catch me every single time. And I still hate wearing hats. Well, one day my life was about to change as one of the jump school instructors happened to come by on his Army Harley surplus motorcycle and asked me if I wanted a ride. We seemed to hit it off right away and after a few months of dating, he asked me to marry him. And of course, I said yes. I went into the orderly room one day and asked for a three-day pass. And the company clerk said, the captain wants to talk to you. So the captain and I sat down for our chat and she proceeded to tell me that I wasn't attracted to the man, that I was attracted to the motorcycle and that I shouldn't get married. And I thought, well, gee, I don't think so. Well, anyway, after I talked her into giving me that three-day pass, Marvin and I got in his motorcycle in the rain and went over the Chattahoochee River to the Phoenix City courthouse in Alabama where a justice of the peace with a big giant chaw of chewing tobacco in his mouth dripping down his shirt down his chin married us when the war came to an end in 1945 both Marvin and I got honorable discharges and lived the civilian life for a couple of years we went back to California he tried his hand at owning a gas station and among other jobs and in 1948 he decided to go back into the army and make a career of it. By this time our oldest daughter Marlene was two years old and we just had the one child at the time and we traveled to France and lived there and traveled all over the United States living on army posts and travel trailers. We had quite a life as a military family. When Marvin decided to retire from the Army in 1968, we moved to California and he had a second career with the California Highway Patrol and I took a civil service job at McClellan Air Force Base in Sacramento. And I worked all kinds of jobs there. I was in clerical, I drove a forklift, I even repaired airplane altimeters. We both permanently retired in 1978 and we built a home in Auburn, California and we continued to travel. We took our RV and wintered in Mazatlan, Mexico, Texas, Arizona and since Marvin was retired from the Army we were able to take those military hops overseas for practically nothing. I might have been born in 1924 but my life really started that day in 1945 when I married the love of my life. 72 years later, two daughters, grandkids, great grandkids. <laughs> I'd love to have a chat with that captain now about me not getting married. And yes, I did like his motorcycle and the many he had after that. It's been one hell of a ride with that cute paratrooper and I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs>